Welcome, everyone. I'm Dick Deming. I'm medical director of Mercy One Cancer Center, and I'm the founder of Above and Beyond Cancer. Welcome to our weekly cancer education series. It's brought to you in part by a grant from the Iowa Cancer Consortium. And my guest tonight is my friend also, Dr. Tiffany Torstenson. Uh, Tiffany grew up in Cedar Rapids, Cedar Rapids, Kennedy, What's the mascot of Cedar Rapids Kennedy? Go Cougars. Go Cougars, yeah. okay. And, and then uh, went to Simpson College undergrad, Des Moines University for her medical degree, and then did her general surgery residency at Mercy in Des Moines, and then did a fellowship in breast surgery at Mayo Clinic, returned to Des Moines where she is a breast surgeon at the Katzman Breast Center, which is part of the uh, Mercy Comfort Center for Health for Women. And um, we're just so glad to have her here tonight. Mm -hmm. But even more importantly, I have to tell you, I'm so glad to have had her as a teammate for the last nine years. Um, One of the very first breast uh, fellowship trained folks to to come back to Iowa and be uh, in a practice exclusively in mm-hmm. breast surgery. Over the course of my career, not Tiffany's, but my career, typically um, uh, the the surgeons that did breast surgery were the same surgeons that removed gallbladders and did hernias and um, uh, appendectomies and a little bit of everything. And and there were you know very 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 good surgeons, but the specialty of taking care of women with breast cancer. I mean, that has changed and there's so many special techniques and we'll, we'll get a little into yeah. that a little bit. So Tiffany, welcome. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. And I'm, I'm happy to be here and I'm, I'm so pleased to be also a part of your new finding of the Cancer Center. We're very, very privileged, me and Dr. Beck, to go over there and experience that amazing facility. And we just are very proud and honored to do that, Dick. So I just want to And we'll talk a bit about that, how uh, just this year uh, that has changed maybe the way that um, women go through their breast cancer journey. Um, What, how, how did you decide? Um, was it in medical school or was it during your general surgery residency that you decided that you wanted to dedicate your career to breast care? Yeah. So, so when I started general surgery, you know, you first go in and you're going to, you know, be a brain surgeon or a heart surgeon, you know, you start out, you know, for the sky and then, you know, the more and more you get more experience and you meet certain, you know, surgeons that you kind of idolize. You're like, wow, they're, they're pretty neat stuff. And I had the opportunity to meet Dr. Susan Beck and, um, She's an amazing surgeon. She kind of taught me about everything I know. And so I would follow her a lot, especially in my kind of second and third year, you kind of decide in residency kind of where your kind of niches or kind of what your passion is. And it was kind of between breast oncology or plastic surgery because I like the cosmetic side of things, but I kind of was like, I don't want to do cosmetics all the time. And so breast kind of gave me the medical side, but also we can do and dabble in some cosmetics. And so so that kind of lured me to that kind of field. And, you know, like Dick said, you know, 20 years ago, we didn't have, you know, breast surgeons, but I feel like breast cancer is becoming so more in detail, the biologics of breast cancer, how we diagnose this, there's certain types that we've now dedicated a surgical field to that. So that's kind of where my journey started. I think though, Dr. Beck was a big part of that. So how was it um, applying to go to Mayo for a fellowship? They they don't accept too many people. Yeah. So research is huge, um, you know, for mostly any fellowship after beyond surgical training. And so I was very fortunate to go down to MD Anderson for actually two occasions and work with some of, um, actually I worked with lots of the radiation oncologists and some of the physicists to do um, looking at radiation. One of the, we got a poster printed for that. So that was one of my projects. And then we did another. Was that another, during your residency, my your residency, general surgery yes, residency? Yes, that was during my residency. Okay. And then um, I actually worked with another surgical project. But so you have to definitely do research. And that's kind of what I figured out. And then I also you know, and letters are important, you know, recommendations and things like that. But it wasn't as competitive. Now it's becoming very competitive. I think like, you know, how everything is yes. now, you know. And so when I applied, there was about, I think about 50 candidates because we kind of see them on the interview trail, you know, and now 
when I applied, there was, I think, maybe about 30 fellowships. Now there's up to like 100, and it's... Under different fellowships around the country. Yep, and around the certain, different countries. How long was the fellowship? It was one year. So, so, one so year. for your, uh, for those who don't, so your training was uh, obviously four years of college, four years of medical school, and then the general surgery residency program was how many years? That's five years. Five so, years, yep, and then so the breast fellowship was yep. one year on top of that. Yep. So. Yes. So... Um, do you remember um, back during your maybe your either medical school or your residency it, taking care of a cancer patient or taking care of cancer patients? What what aspect of caring for breast cancer patients that uh, sort of made you realize that that was the career you wanted? What I really enjoy about breast kind of oncology versus just like the general surgery aspect of it is, you know, you would meet a patient, you know, they have gallstones or they'd have a hernia, you know, you'd see them 20 minutes, you'd have them in surgery in two weeks, and then you'd see them back in 10 days and then they were gone, you know, and I was like, I really enjoy building relationships with people. I think that's the biggest thing, you know. I have met so many wonderful people, you know, I mean, actually one of my patients, one of her daughter's nannies from, you know, like you meet so many different mm -hmm. kind of people and you develop these friendships and these relationships with people. And that kind of, kind of brought me to this kind of field. And also it's one of the fields, you know, I mean, oncology is, it's sad sometimes. I mean, I, I would love to say every single one of my patients, you know, lives, but I can't say that, but it's one of the oncologic fields that we care lots of cancer, you know, and that's what I like to see, you know? And so I think it's relationships and that, you know, I can follow them for a long time and they do well through their journey. Okay. And we're going to talk about the journey. So yeah. uh, we're going to talk a bit about how uh, women first get diagnosed and then the process that happens over time. So uh, one of the most common scenarios is a woman goes in for a screening mammogram. And screening mammogram means by definition that the woman doesn't have any symptoms of breast cancer, that uh, mammograms help find breast cancers before they're it can be large enough to cause any symptoms. So let's have that be, let's say it's a 60 year old woman who goes in for her annual mammogram. She's been going for 10 years and she goes in and um, when you have a screening mammogram, you actually get your mammogram and you leave. So it, in a screening mammogram, a doctor doesn't come out and show you your mammogram and talk to you. You get it done and you leave and you're told, well, you'll be getting a letter in the mail in a week, maybe is what you're told. So if it's abnormal, what's the process by which that woman who just had a screening mammogram that shows an abnormality, what's the process by which you yeah. will be notified of the abnormality? So we have now at Mercy uh, kind of a radio radiographic tech now or a navigator for our um, our facility. And so this is the beauty of this. So in most places you get a letter in five days and it says we'll be contacting you because it's a basically a by reds. You get a score of zero, meaning we see something, you got to come back and we've got to do more imaging. Kind of the beauty of Mercy and our radiology center is that our navigator will get on that phone. And sometimes before you even make it out the door, they'll be calling you you know, if they have time and they will bring you back for so more imaging. You're informed. And, and typically at that point, you're not informed you have cancer no. because most callbacks and workups end up being benign. So, but we have a human being that mm -hmm. calls and says, you know, there was something that showed up in the mammogram that we need to work up a little bit further. We're going to be scheduling you to come back in to do some additional views. Mm -hmm. And so the patient would come back in and it might be as soon as the next day and they'll do some close up views and maybe an ultrasound. Mm -hmm. And at that point, those images are called diagnostic images. So when you come in for a screening, you don't have any symptoms. It's called a screening mammogram. When you come back, it's for a purpose, and that's because of the abnormal mammogram. So the actual mammogram doctor will be there in the suite when you have your additional images. 
and they will have a conversation with you. And at lots of times when we schedule our diagnostics, we will schedule them with the possible biopsy, you know, which is nice. So then you don't have to come back for a third time. So, and they always try, if they find something on the mammogram, they try to match it with an ultrasound, especially if it's a mass associated finding on your mammogram. And at that point, then a lot of times the radiologist will come in and talk to you. And I think our radiologists were very blessed to have some very, very good radiologists that work for us, that they will go into a room and kind of speak to you and kind of say, hey, we need to biopsy this. Do you want to do it? And most patients obviously want to get it done that same day. And then depending on how they saw the lesion, so if they saw it very good with ultrasound, they will do like an ultrasound and guided biopsy. Or if they couldn't see it by ultrasound, then they will put a patient back in the mammogram machine and do what's called a stereotactic biopsy because we need that tissue to get that diagnosis. Yep. And and as you pointed out, the, the biopsy can be done often the same day, unlike some procedures where you've got to fast the night before and not have anything to eat and uh, have a driver there. Fortunately, the breast biopsy in the mammogram suite area is a fairly simple, straightforward, and a lot of times when you're having those extra images done, they can do the biopsy the same day. Um, the results are not known that day. So we, you're not, uh, the, the radiologist who's there doing the biopsy doesn't, it doesn't have a microscope to look at the biopsy and say, is this cancer or benign? So the next step would be the patient goes home after the biopsy. What's the process by which the patient is informed of the biopsy results? So that is also kind of the radiology, um, radiographic navigator, we call her. And so any biopsy done through our radiology department is going to be called by her or if it is cancer, a lot of times she will then alert our navigators. So we had two surgical navigators, one kind of for Dr. Beck and then one for me. And those are nurses. Nurse navigators, yeah. yes. So And so uh, they, um, our nurse navigators are very experienced with cancer. So as you all know, uh, nurses are, are wonderful and an experienced nurse has had many, many, many hours of experience talking to individuals. So it's that call to inform someone that they have cancer is a difficult call. And uh, many of you in your room, in this room, probably know exactly where you were when someone spoke the words, you have cancer. And uh, the information needs to be given clearly, but also with hope and optimism and with a plan for where we go from there. So um, our, our fictional patient right now just got a call from your nurse navigator and informed her that, that the biopsy shows she has cancer. What's the additional information that navigator would give the patient and what would be the next step? Yeah. So what they try to do is they kind of tell them what kind of cancer they have. You know, it's usually of the ductal or their lobular kind of origin. Those are the two main structures of breast. And there's different subtypes, but most times it's going to be a ductal or a lobular. So they kind of tell them that. They will usually go over the grade of the cancer. Now, grade, lots of people get grade and stage kind of confused sometimes. So we grade tumors based on one, two, or three. And it kind of goes with how aggressive those tumors are. And so they try to give them that. And then we also talk about the biomarkers. Biomarkers are huge, you know, in breast cancer. And the biomarkers we look at are the estrogen receptor, the progesterone receptor, and the HER2 nu receptor. Estrogen and progesterone are hormones, and lots of breast cancers are very sensitive to those hormones. And then some breast cancers will exemplify a certain protein called the HER2 nu protein. And so they try to give them that information as well. And then if there was, you know, a possible lymph node, lymph node that was biopsy, they will talk to that if it's positive or negative or any kind of terms. Well, that's kind of the main body that they will talk to them about. Honestly. And then will they also have at that point an appointment scheduled for them? Yes. And so then they will have an appointment with Dr. Beck or Dr. or me. 
Yep. So Dr. Beck and Dr. Torres. So, so up until this point, the patient hasn't seen a cancer doctor. I mean, mm-hmm. yes, the radiologists are involved in cancer, but radiologists are very, very good, uh, but, but they're not the, the tr- the doctors that actually treat the cancer. So um, oftentimes in breast cancer, the patient will not have met uh, a breast cancer doctor until after the biopsy. So uh, as Dr. Torson said, we are blessed that we have two uh, uh, breast cancer surgeons that are dedicated their life to breast cancer. And they're both at the uh, Katzman Breast Center. So they'd get scheduled to see either Dr. Tiff- Tiffany Torstensen or Dr. Susan Beck. Then what would your first meeting with a patient who's uh, had mammograms, diagnostic, and a biopsy? Yeah. So the first meeting, what I always do is, you know, I obviously, we, I learn a little bit about my patients, kind of where they're from, and they learn about me. And then kind of what we first do is we really go over the PATH report, you know, because PATH reports can be um, very overwhelming. There's a lots of information in those PATH reports, you know, and a lots of it's kind of path, the pathologist driven, you know, and so we really try to go over that. I kind of call it the Bible of the cancer because this is kind of how we base lots of our treatment on. And so I kind of go over the things, the navigators went over them in a little more details. You know, we kind of look at some pictures about how lobular cancer looks under a microscope or ductal cancer looks under the microscope. And then I also go over their imaging. You know, we talk about density a lot, so their breast, and then also at that time, we kind of decide treatment plan or what additional studies are needed. And so I think that's kind of what we'll touch on next here is because a lots of times it just doesn't stop with a mammogram or an ultrasound. We are using MRIs a lot now. Um, MRIs change our plans about 30% of the times. And MRIs are a very, very sensitive radiographic study. I think it's kind of like a, it's a very big roadmap of our breast, not just looking at the cancer side, but it looks at the contralateral side or the opposite side as well. And it will also look at lymph nodes and stuff. And so many times we are doing an MRI prior to any, you know, whether it's surgery or starting with chemo first. And then also sometimes we have to do what's called a PET scan too. Now, if their lymph node is positive or skin is positive or they have a very large tumor, we always want to make sure that cancer has not gone to other parts of the body because that has to do with staging and also guides us in treating these patients. So the MRI is done to look more closely at both breasts and at the lymph nodes that are near the breast. But a PET scan would be done primarily to look for any cancer that might be in other parts of the body. Yep. So, um, and then um, the, 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 the deciding on the plan of care. So in olden days, maybe 10 years ago, um, 20 years ago, you know, it was surgery first and then, then after surgery, okay, do they need chemo or do they need radiation? So it was surgery first and then do you add the other things? Now, with many types of breast cancer, we might actually start with chemotherapy up front and wait and do surgery later. What are the circumstances in which you would recommend a woman receive chemotherapy before she has the surgery? It's a great question, Dick, because, you know, some of my my nurse practitioners, so there's not really a gold standard on when we give neoadjuvant, you know, I still... And the term neoadjuvant means giving the chemo first. So when you do surgery and then give the chemo after surgery, we call that adjuvant chemotherapy. When you bring the chemotherapy before surgery, we call it neoadjuvant, meaning neo new first. So, so yeah. when do you give neo adjuvant chemotherapy? So that's a great question. I, um, so I still, you know, from my fellowship, I have a little thing that my, my Dr. Bowie, who is, um, she's kind of a world renowned surgeon and a researcher has just had this little sheet of paper in her office and kind of wrote down what she thought neo adjuvant patients should undergo. So I still have that always sitting on my desk. It's funny how we grab, we gravitate to that stuff. So when I consider neo adjuvant, you know, any locally advanced breast cancer or an inflammatory breast cancer. So, you know, just to kind of decipher them quickly, locally advanced breast tumor is maybe one that's involving the skin, 
um, can fungate. Um, lymph nodes, you know, are always taken in consideration as well when you're considering giving chemo up front. HER2 status is big, you know. Um, we really push for neoadjuvant. Um, mostly my kind of cutoff is about two for, for centimeters. HER2 for a HER2 positive, yeah. yes. So, so HER2 positive tumors yes. tend to be a bit more aggressive. But there's special uh, targeted medicines that have been invented to treat HER2. Yes. So first indication would be a locally advanced, which is described as a big tumor or one that involves the skin or a lot of lymph nodes. So that would be a locally advanced where you would do neoadjuvant chemo first. Second indication would be uh, a tumor that's HER2 positive. They tend to be more aggressive, but there is a special medicine that can be used. And so HER2 positive, not every HER2 positive, no, like, a, uh -huh. like a very small tumor yeah. that's HER2 positive, you'd probably still do surgery. Yeah, I think two first. centimeters is about kind of where okay. I kind of start leaning to that point um, okay. when they're over two centimeters. And then our triple negative breast cancer, so those are overly aggressive tumors. And what does triple negative mean? So those are tumors that those biomarkers, the estrogen, the progesterone, and the HER2 are all negative. So they have no basically stimulation. They're just growing, but they have no kind of anything that's stimulating them to grow. And triple negative tumors tend to be the most aggressive of the breast cancers. So the most favorable is estrogen receptor positive, progesterone receptor positive, HER2 negative. That's the most um, uh, least aggressive of the breast cancers. And the most aggressive is negative, 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 triple negative. So a triple negative breast cancer, again, if it was a really small uh, breast cancer and the lymph nodes weren't involved and it was triple negative, you still might do surgery first. But once it gets to about two centimeters and it's triple negative, then we know that um, it can be more aggressive. And so we tend to move the chemotherapy up front before yep. the surgery. And then the, the kind of the gray zone in, we're learning more about this every day, are tumors kind of called our luminal B tumors. So those are kind of our maybe a grade two or a grade three tumor that can be estrogen positive, kind of low progesterone, and lots of them are in HER2 negative. And so in those cases, we kind of look at, and sometimes we do genetic testing on the tumor. That's not genetic testing of the patient. And we have a recurrence score, and it tells us if it's going to, it's kind of like a bad actor or a high recurrence or a low recurrence. And so we're using these tests to help us guide in these kind of gray areas where should we be doing upfront chemo on these luminal B tumors? Um, definitely if they're involving lymph nodes, yes, we do. But sometimes if you have a, let's say a three centimeter luminal B tumor, you know, before we give you chemo, we want to know that it's going to help them. And so we're using these genetic studies a lot more to help us guide. Us, so. so Tiffany, can you explain the difference between a person going in and getting genetic testing? Like, do I have the BRCA gene? Do I have genes that I inherited? Yeah. Do I have genes that cause cancer that I might give to my kids? So genetic testing, what's the difference between genetic yeah. testing and then the difference between that and doing genomic testing of the tumor cells? That's a great question. And I think that kind of confuses patients sometimes. So your genetics, you know, you get 50% of your genes from mom and 50% of your genes from dad. And so we all have certain genes that are supposed to protect us from getting certain types of cancers. It's just not breast cancer. There's, you know, genes that protect us from colon cancer, you know, all different sorts. And so what they look at is that's the beauty of working with a genetic um, counselor is that if you qualify, that means if you have a lots of family history of, you know, breast, ovarian, colon, prostate, even gastric cancer, they will kind of decide a panel that will look at those genes that are supposed to protect you from getting cancer and see if there's any mutations in them. And so that can explain a lot of times why women have breast cancer. So that's your own genes. But the tumor also has its own set of genes. And these tests, and you guys have maybe heard of the test called mammoprint and oncotype. Oncotype is probably the one we probably use the most, but there's also mammoprint. 
And those look at the genes of the tumor itself to let us know how kind of aggressive that tumor is or basically tells us if it's a high recurrence or a low recurrence. So those two genetics test kind of our two different separate basically set of genes we're testing. And those can be helpful in determining whether uh, the patient's cancer cells are likely to benefit from having chemotherapy or maybe just hormone therapy. Just saw a patient yeah. today. Um, she was grade three. So the pathologist using the pathologist eyeballs, looking at the slide saying, is it a one, two, or three with one being least aggressive, three meaning most aggressive, said it was a three. But when we did the oncotype, it came out with a really low score saying that the chances of chemotherapy providing any benefit is less than 1%. And that a hormone therapy alone, meaning anti-estrogen treatment, was going to be sufficient for this patient. And that was a, t a patient where, you know, with a grade three, there might have been leaning toward, oh, we'd better do chemotherapy. But the genomic testing of the cancer cells that looks at many more things than just what a pathologist's eyeball can see on a microscope slide gives much more accurate and predictive information. Yeah. And it's really beneficial because kind of like you said, probably 20 years ago, you know, that that patient probably would have got chemo. And we're using also those tests even to guide us in node positive patients. You know, 20 years ago, having nodal, you know, disease was always an indication for chemo. And now we can use these studies um, that patients usually between one and three nodes that are positive to also help us. Because sometimes we think, oh gosh, this lady had, you know, two nodes that are positive, you know, and then you get your recurrent score back and it's low and it's, she she got to miss chemo, which is, you know, obviously yes. is wonderful. So it's kind of the American way is always to do more, but in, in certain types of cancer, like breast cancer, where the cure, cure rate is so good, actually a lot of the focus now is can these tests help reduce the aggressiveness of our treatment to get the same results and spare a lot of toxicity? So um, that has changed a lot of what we do, not only in breast cancer, but other cancers. But now let's, let's uh, we're, we're following this patient on her path. Yes. And so let's say that it was a, a triple negative and uh, a lymph node was involved. And um, we have a multidisciplinary cancer conference for breast cancer. It meets once a week. Every case is presented. The surgeons are there. The radiation oncologists are there. The medical oncologists are there. The pathologists are there. The diagnostic radiologists are there. The genetic counselor is there. So uh, this patient has also had genetic testing and doesn't have any genes that she has that, that uh, caused the cancer. The genomic testing was done and there's a high score and it's triple negative. So the Breast Cancer Conference meets and recommends neoadjuvant uh, chemotherapy. So a chemotherapy before surgery. Uh, Dr. Torsen, as a surgeon, when do you have the conversation with the patient about, okay, I'll start with the chemo, but I know I'm gonna have surgery. What are my surgical options? Yeah. So with a triple negative breast cancer, you know, these cancers are going to, and I agree with Dick, I would definitely recommend neoadjuvant for her. But, um, and that usually comes at our first meeting, especially when you have a triple negative breast cancer in this. Low. So you kind of know their path in the beginning. So you kind of start prepping them, like we're going to get you into the medical oncologist. We're going to start the neoadjuvant chemotherapy probably get an MRI, you know, prior to her chemo and then an MRI when she finishes kind of what we start with and what we end with. And our goal, and I feel that, you know, you know, 20 years ago, I think we did a lot more mastectomies, you know, I feel as a surgeon in this day and age, you know, I really want to push for breast preservation and radiation because we know based on multiple studies that women do very well in about equivalent to the recurrence rates and overall survival if they would have a mastectomy. So sometimes big is not always better, mm -hmm. we always say. So a uh, lots of times the neoadjuvant will, let's say they have a four centimeter tumor at that point. Let's say, I don't know how what we sized her or not, but let's just say okay. she was four centimeters. And 
that tumor is going to shrink because it's an aggressive tumor. Chemo attacks aggressive cells. So we can talk to her about having a lumpectomy at that point, you know, and if she's interested in it, that is our goal. And so that just also spurs us to do the new adjuvant because one, we could get her down to maybe even half centimeter or centimeters, which is going to make her surgical outcome much easier and also make her a lumpectomy candidate. So we definitely talk about surgery prior to the chemo and to see kind of where their goal is at. Now, some women just look at me and say, you know, Dr. T, I know what you're saying. I know the data. I say, I know the overall survival is the same, but I'm having this breast off, you know. So there um maybe three options and you can probably come up with other yeah. options. So you use the term breast preservation and yep, lumpectomy. lumpectomy. So obviously that means you just remove the breast tumor and a, a rim of normal breast tissue around okay. it to make sure you get it all. That's the lumpectomy. You sample some lymph nodes. Uh, that's a sentinel sentinel, node sentinel lymph node biopsy. biopsy. Um, so th that would be one form of treatment. Mm -hmm. A second form of treatment would be like a mastectomy on the side that you have the cancer. Correct. But another surgery option is to have both breasts removed. It's called a bilateral mastectomy mm -hmm. with or without reconstruction at the mm -hmm. same time. What, uh, under what circumstances would you recommend the lumpectomy versus a one-sided mastectomy versus bilateral mastectomy with or without reconstruction? Great question. So a lumpectomy, you have to have a good breast-to-tumor ratio, okay? Because obviously if you have like an A-sized cup and have, you know, a four-centimeter tumor, you're not a good candidate for it because we're taking too much breast tissue out and we're going to leave you kind of disformed and stuff. And a lots of that decision is also patient driven. You know, some women know coming in, they don't want to keep the breast. But definitely before lumpectomy, you know, you have to talk to them about breast to tumor ratio. That's the biggest kind of thing. If they've had, you know, previous cancer or radiation, you know, they can't have radiation again. So then the standard of care in those kind of patients is to undergo a mastectomy. When it comes to what kind of mastectomy, you know, there's different types of mastectomies, okay? There is kind of what I call cosmetic mastectomies, which we try to preserve the skin. That's called a skin sparing. Or if we try to preserve the nipple, which is a nipple sparing. And those two mastectomies have to have reconstruction, you know. Those are the cosmetic mastectomies because we want to keep that envelope of the breast as normal as possibly so an implant or tissue, kind of our adipose tissue or basically our fat tissue can go place that breast. So let's talk a little bit more yeah. about that. So I have to say the first time I saw a patient who came in to see me said that she had had bilateral mastectomies and we opened the gown and there visibly is all of her skin, her nipples and two breasts. And it's like uh, you, both of your breasts have been <laughs> removed. So that concept, when a woman has a uh, nipple sparing, and obviously you're the surgeon, when, when you see it after all of the skin is there, the nipple is there, Dr. Torstenson has removed the breast tissue that's under the skin and one of the plastic surgeons has placed tissue or implants in there, but you actually see visibly what looks like their breasts. Yeah, it's so amazing. So talk a little bit more about uh, performing yeah. a bilateral nipple sparing mastectomy and the role you play and the role the plastic surgeon yeah. plays. And So when a woman chooses a mastectomy, I was going to kind of answer about kind of the bilateral. When women choose to do the other side, it's more for risk reduction. It's about a 97 to 98% risk reduction for future breast cancer. Everyone says, well, Dr. T, if you remove it, why can I still get breast cancer? And there are still some ducts and lobules that can form in the future, but it's strictly for risk reduction, you know, and that's why women choose. And they also choose it for cosmetics reasons because a reconstructed breast does look different than a native breast. And so they want to be symmetrical. And when it comes to the nipple sparing, yes, those are kind of the, we've been doing them now for probably 10, 15 years. And, um, 
we want those patients to look like they've almost had an augmentation. You know, that's our goal. We, we want them to look like they went and had a cosmetic procedure versus a cancer surgery. And that's kind of our goal, you know, obviously oncologic safety, but also we want, you know, them to be feminine. They want to be good in a bathing suit. They want to feel still good in their clothes. And the beauty about that mastectomy is we do, we do it like a incision underneath the fold and stuff. And so the breast kind of hangs over there. So you barely can even see the incision. We test the tissue underneath the nipple because we are leaving more tissue, which, you know, people get worried that could that harbor cancer down the road. So we take a, what's called a retro or biopsy, or just basically a biopsy behind the nipple. And we send it to a pathologist why we're operating and they will tell us if that biopsy is clean. So then we know we're safe to keep that nipple and that areola intact. But it's a it's a very beautiful procedure and women are very, very happy with it. Um, it's a tougher procedure, you know, because um, it's a small incision and, you know, we're working down here to get way up here to the clavicle to take that tissue. And the best way, like I describe it to patients and, you know, it's tis the season, we're getting close to Halloween. So it's, it's like a pumpkin. And honestly, when you carve a pumpkin, you carve the top, and, you know, you take the top off and you can scoop out everything out of there. And if you put the top back on, you would never know on that pumpkin you took off kind of the inside of the pumpkin. And that's kind of how I explain it. It's like we just go and take the breast tissue, we close the incision, and it looks like you have your normal breast tissue. So, And then um, it, with the uh, bilateral nipple sparing, mm -hmm. there's a plastic surgery component yeah. because you've taken out all the breast tissue, so you need to put something yes. in there. What are the different things you can put in the pumpkin? Yes, uh, the you pumpkin, the, that's before right. Before you put the lid back on. Yes. So the most common is what we call implant-based reconstruction, okay? That can start with a direct implant. That means that there's no additional surgery. Um, women who have an implant base right away, though, are mostly smaller women, okay, because it's harder when you're larger breasted to fit that implant to make it look good. So some women can go directly to an implant. Some women have to have a temporary implant called an expander, and that goes in the day of surgery or after I finish the mastectomy, and that is filled up either with air or sailing over a period of months to get them to the size they want. Slowly expands. Slowly, yes, and expands that skin, um, as well as if also for radiation purposes, if they need radiation afterwards, the radiation kind of causes some tightness to that. So we want to expand that skin before we start radiation or we before we give the patient back to Dr. Deming to start. And then the last case is um, what we use is called a deep flap. And that's those are very, very big surgeries. Um, that's where you kind of actually get a tummy tuck out of it, which is kind of nice. But they basically take kind of the lower fat kind of pad of a woman and take both sides of that and bring it up and connect the vessels that are supplying the blood to that fat to the vessels under here in the ribs. So they do have to cut some ribs, but it's a very, very natural kind of um, reconstruction versus, you know, having that implant, which is unnatural, where as women, they feel much more like your native kind of breast tissue because it's your own fat. So that's the uh, bilateral nipple sparing. And uh, that is done in combination with you and a plastic surgeon. And we mentioned the three different types of um, implants that can yeah. be done. Um, the radiation, maybe we should talk a little yeah. bit about which women need radiation after they've had their surgery. Yeah. So most of the time, and granted, you know, we're always getting away from treatment. And Dick, you can cut me off here if I step out of turn here. Um, Lumpectomies we know do better with radiation. It comes down to recurrence rates. So most, you know, every time I do a lumpectomy, I always send them to the radiation oncologist and then they can have that decision, you know, is it going to benefit? If is it not, you know, and sometimes we're not doing it, you yeah. know. So and, standard that the, the um, yeah. NSABP study that mm -hmm. showed that lumpectomy was equal to mastectomy and cure was a three arm study. So there are mm -hmm. Uh, the breast cancer women, a third of them received a lumpectomy without radiation. 
a third of them received lumpectomy followed by radiation, and a third of them had their whole breast removed, a mastectomy. And the study showed that the women who had the mastectomy and the women who had the lumpectomy followed by radiation had the same low risk of recurrence. The women who had the lumpectomy without radiation had about a 30% recurrence within the breast over the next 10 years. Um, now, fortunately, those women who participated in the study, they still ended up having a high cure rate, but they subsequently had to have a mastectomy. So that study uh, that was, you know, almost 50 years ago now was what showed that a lumpectomy with radiation was equal to a mastectomy. We talked about how we're trying to uh, now with high cure rates, trying to see are there some women that don't need chemotherapy that we thought they used to need chemotherapy. The same thing is being done with radiation. Are there some women whose tumors are so favorable that even after lumpectomy, they don't need the radiation, meaning the risk of recurrence is so low. And so there are now studies looking at women over the age of 70 that have a fairly well-behaved tumor that isn't very big, that it's hard to prove that, that they're adding the radiation provides them much benefit. So you're going to see more and more situations where instead of just, oh, you had a lumpectomy, you have to have radiation, even though you're 90 years old. I mean, they, some types of breast tumors would take so long to regrow that the older a patient is and the more well-behaved the tumor is, the less likely that it's going to recur in that patient's lifetime. So that's where age factors in because um, slow-growing tumors take maybe 20 years to grow. And if your life expectancy based on your age and all of your other um, medical risks is, is such that that's not a realistic life expectancy, then adding the radiation in probably isn't necessary. Yeah. So the, more and more, we're going to yeah. be looking at the individual patients and we'll probably be looking at some of those genomic factors on the, the where, where, where we're looking at the actual Mary Doe's breast cancer cells based on all of the genomic markers. We'll probably have more and more information that will allow us to personalize the yeah. care. So rather than just saying the guidelines, this patient needs chemo, this patient needs radiation, there'll be individually uh, decisions made based on the patient's yeah. own tumor. Yeah, and just to add to that, you know, we kind of, you know, 70 is also kind of the age where Dr. Beck and I are not doing nodal surgery on some of these tumors. You know, we always would always on invasive tumors, take some lymph nodes out, check them, make sure, you know, the breast cells haven't traveled from the breast to the lymph nodes. But in favorable tumors, you know, in women who are in their 70s, we are getting away from doing those sentinel node biopsies or checking those lymph nodes. So, so one of the, the characteristics of breast cancer um, is that uh, breast cancer does is more common the older we get. The older a woman is, the more likely the breast cancer is going to be a slow-growing, well-behaved, indolent breast cancer. So much more common to have breast cancer after menopause. The younger women can have more aggressive tumors. And so not only do they have a longer life expectancy where they might benefit from the treatment, but their tumors tend to be more aggressive than the typical run-of-the-mill breast cancer that happens in a 65, 75-year-old mm -hmm. woman. And so um, going back to the radiation, um, you know, mastectomy um, radiations or post-mastectomy radiation. So I always tell my patients there's about three reasons why, you know, I would recommend or I would get you to the radiation oncologist. I always say, you know, a tumor greater than five centimeters, and that's that's an invasive tumor. Sometimes we have, you know, pre-invasive or DCIS that's large, but we don't radiate that. So it has to be an invasive tumor over five centimeters, a positive margin. That means sometimes if there's, we can't get space between the tissue and the skin and that margin becomes positive, we would send them to the radiation oncologist and um, also a lymph nodes that are positive. You know, we're, we're radiating patients with one lymph node. It, you know, used mm. to be three to four, it used to be. And so we're 
That is always a discussion. These yes. Days. So uh, generally speaking, a patient that has a lumpectomy gets radiation. That's the general speaking. As I mentioned, some might be able to avoid it if it's very uh, well behaved. Most women who have a mastectomy don't have to have radiation, but some women who have a mastectomy, if they've got a large tumor or multiple positive lymph nodes or positive margin, then they might need, they might benefit from the radiation even after the surgery. Radiation has changed over the years. So what we've done with radiation, we're much more accurate and precise and using smaller fields. So we've been able to go to a higher dose per day, which results in fewer treatments. So classically, when I started here at Mercy Cancer Center 33 years ago, women would typically get about 33 radiation treatments if they've had a lumpectomy. And now it's down to about 15. Um, so we do a higher dose per day, fewer treatments, cure rates the same, the cosmetic results are the same, but it's much more convenient for the patient and less expensive for, you know, the overall yeah. healthcare in general. So that, so that would be the radiation. Yeah. How about um, five to 10 years of a pill? It's a kind of an anti-estrogen. When do, when do women benefit yeah. by taking uh, what we call hormone therapy. And what is, what is yeah. in breast cancer, what does the term hormone, hormone therapy, therapy mean? It's funny because we say hormone therapy. And so people are like, oh, you're going to give me a the hormone, Dr. T? I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> so that kind of comes into surveillance a little bit. I mean, we also use those pills sometimes, you know, prior to surgery too, um, which we'll get into more we can talk about. But there is basically four drugs out there that the medical oncologist will talk to a woman about who has a hormone positive breast cancer. So that means, you know, the estrogen is positive. Um, and that's the one receptor we really focus on. These medications, what they do is they help our body convert estrogen to not in its form to basically stimulate growth in our breasts. Because the problem of the estrogen, it's a growth factor. It's great. Estrogen's great when we're, you know, teenagers and we're developing breasts. That's, that's great because we have all those helper cells to recognize the cells that turn into bad actors. But as we get older, we don't want that estrogen stimulating growth in our breasts because we've lost the good cells that kind of pick up the cancer cells to kill them are what we call apoptosis. So these pills go in and block this estrogen and it helps one to decrease recurrence rates, but it also, if a patient has a contralateral side, protects that breast from also developing breast cancer. So I think the medical oncologist quoted about it, about a 20 to 30% risk reduction. Um, but along come some side effects with those medications. Some of those medications, like the biggest one and the oldest one is tamoxifen, can be given to both pre- and postmenopausal women. But the other class, which is a newer class of drugs, is called the aromatase inhibitors. The most common are like letrozole and anastrozole. But those can only be given to postmenopausal women. And some women say, well, why is that? Um, because actually, they block the estrogen in a premenopausal woman who is ovulating, it stimulates um, the ovaries to go into overdrive. So it's almost a fertility drug. And actually, letrozole is used as a fertility drug. So we don't want to use those in a kind of a, a patient who is still having periods. So, so that's, uh, as, as Dr. Torses said, the, the hormone therapy, the pills that actually block the ex estrogen are uh, usually added in after the breast surgery, the radiation, and or the chemotherapy for those women who have an estrogen receptor positive tumor. And it's considered adjuvant. So at that point, the woman is likely cured of her cancer, but it reduces the risk of a cancer coming back in the breast where she had the cancer or in the other breast as well. But that's 10 years of taking this pill. If the pill had zero side effects, uh, every woman would probably happily take it. Although some would forget. I mean, it's like taking a vitamin in the morning. I maybe, maybe two days a week I remember to do it. But, uh, um, but it has side effects. And at some point in time, and it might be one week after they start or it might be six months, like, I've got to take this for 10 years? 
Uh, maybe I'd rather die of breast cancer. Uh, I, I've heard I'm that being before. only a little bit facetious, but uh, some women have significant side effects from the um, hormone therapy. And, and so uh, when someone has finished their cancer treatment, and then, oh, by the way, here's, here's this medicine for 10 more years. And I, you just, I thought I was cancer free. Why am I going to take that whole philosophical concept of, is this pill treating the cancer I had? I'll take it. If this just preventing a cancer, what's the chance I'd have a cancer if I didn't take it? And we, we have a hard time being real accurate in predicting that. How do you answer that question? This is what I always say. It, it's funny because um, me and Dr. Beck always say this because um, I feel like we don't give those drugs out. The medical oncologists, I do get some tamoxifen for some patients, but you know when it comes down to cancer, we send them to the medical oncologist to run that. And I feel like they always complain to the surgeons about it. Maybe they complain to you because I'm like, well, have you talked to you know right. your medic? They're like, no. Well, you're a woman, and they, yeah. And the side effects are you know yes. sort of those menopausal side effects. Yes. And so this is kind of what I tell them. So there's ways we can mitigate some of those symptoms. Okay. And um, the biggest you know symptoms are the, for the aromatase inhibitors are kind of the joint pain, kind of the achiness, and then the the bone loss, but, you know, they don't really feel the bone loss. That's more, you know, something that the medical oncologist can give you, but it's more the menopausal symptoms. It's the hot flashes. It's, you know, you know, painful intercourse. It's those kind of things, the nuisance, you know, hair loss sometimes, weight gain, you know. Emotional yes, ability. Yes, definitely. Tears. And so we, there's ways to kind of counteract some of that. Now, I always tell them up front, it's not going to go away completely, you know, and I also tell them, you know, if it's in the first month, you got to give them about six to nine months. That's what I always say. Your body does adjust and it will get better. But we also will help them one and sometimes the medical oncologist will help them with, you know, vitamin E, oxybutrin, it's things to help with hot flashes. There's effects or it's actually an antidepressant, but at a lower dose, it really helps with hot flashes. And then, you know, if it gets to that point, where those things aren't working, we also at the Women's Center have a menopausal specialist and her name's Dr. Stratton. And she's very, very good at treating our cancer patients, not putting them at risk, you know, by putting them on hormones, because we don't want to counteract the effects of the drugs. But there's a lots of kind of homeopathic things that she can do for patients that really do help. So, and then some patients, you know, we try all that stuff and they look at me and they're like, you know, you know, we're not here to make your life miserable. I always say, you know, and I think Dick would agree. And sometimes it just doesn't work. And mm -hmm. some women have tried all four of them and it doesn't work, you know, and it's okay. You know, and sometimes they look at me and they say, is this okay? I'm like, it's okay. It's great. Yeah. It's okay. There's risks you know, and we, benefits. And, yeah. and there are some women who uh, 10 years of it is just not um, compatible with a good quality of life. life. Yeah, it is. And it, it's all about quality of life, especially, you know, after cancer. You know, that's one thing, you know, cancer is horrible, but it also teaches you, I think, you know, that life is short, you know. And I think people, you know, have said to me, some of my patients that I would have never done this before cancer. And I'm sure you get that all mm -hmm. the time. Right. And so we, we want to make, you know, their lives great. You know, we don't want them to be sitting there just profusely sweating and can't do anything or go outside, you know, but we do have ways to mitigate some of those side effects. You know, we're going to have to have you back because we're, we're almost at the end. I want to leave some time for questions. So we did want to get into the whole concept mm -hmm. of after breast cancer and so what is survivorship like and how do we and um so we'll talk more about that specifically but i do want to allow because we have quite a few people here in the room with us our live studio audience and then we have live streaming so we'll open it up to questions we've got a microphone right here right. and jelena you get the first question well, I can say, not that you paid me to say this, I have two awesome doctors. These are my doctors. <laughs> Dr. T, we call you, <laughs> it was, is a great surgeon. So thank, thank you, you, thank you, thank you. you. Um, the navigator was really good. I mean, she explained a lot. She goes, are you okay? Is there any question? No. I mean, she really explained it. But then I said, oh, yeah, my husband's in the lobby because <laughs> we should have brought him. But um, I go, how do I tell him? She, he, she goes, tell me I have a little bit of cancer. And I'm like, um, 
that's like telling mom a little bit of pregnant. And we both laugh because we realized that didn't sound right. She goes, I probably shouldn't have said it that way. I don't know. But, um, but I do have a question about the chemotherapy. Like for my case, I had two different types of chemo with the steroid. So I had a choice of four, four cycles and six cycles. And I never thought of asking, what was the importance of the steroids? What was, you know, the purpose of that? So the steroid is to more mitigate symptoms, okay? So mm -hmm. the steroid is actually really good for anti-nausea medication. We all know we've seen patients, you know, who get very nauseated with chemo. Steroids were great for the nausea. Um, so that's, that's mainly sometimes also people get reactions from the chemo and, you know, rashes and skin things, and it can kind of drop down the histamine. The problem is, though, the steroids can keep you up, and they can cause you to get puffy, and they can affect diabetes, you know. So there's always that win-win. <laughs> but steroids, you know, that's kind of why they do. They premedicate you, basically. It helps decrease the side effects of yeah. the chemo you're getting that day. I had no idea, but yeah. yes. And um, vitamin E does work. Yes. And I, I had to switch from all uh, from losotrol well, if to astrotrol. Big difference. Um, it's it's your body trying yeah. to adjust. Yeah. So it can happen. It works. <laughs> Another question, either from our live studio audience or our live streaming. What are some of the particular side effects of the radiation you're trying to uh, avoid? So the side effects of the radiation, if we're treating the breast, number one, you get like a, a sunburn of the breast. But when you treat the breast, you also treat the underlying pectoralis muscle. And depending if the lymph nodes are not involved or not, you might add in those other lymph nodes. If you have to add in the lymph nodes, then it increases the risk of getting lymphedema, a swelling of the arm. And the bigger the field is, you also, there's some women who will get a, a myositis, just a... Um, an inflammation of the underlying muscle with some tenderness. And you can also get a little bit of fibrosis, meaning a little bit uh, stiffer, not quite as elastic. And so the, the side effect that you get while you're going through the radiation is more the sunburn. The side effects that happen as scar tissue develops is the greater risk of lymphedema and just um, uh, thickening and stiffening of the muscles of the chest wall. One more. This will be the last question. Dr. T, um, two-year survivor in October, thanks to you and Sue and Dr. Deming and others, um, seeing a lot of people know, diagnosed um, younger and younger, a lot of young adults being, ad being, being diagnosed. Is there are we just screening better? Do you think there's environmental things going on? Why, why do you think so many so young now? I think both. Okay. I think that one, I think we are screening. I think breast cancer is not as taboo as it used to be. You know, we're very open about it. We, we are pushing for screening and, you know, and I feel that women are coming in at 40 and getting their mammograms, you know, more than I think they used to, because I think someone knows a friend, someone knows a family member, you know, we all know someone with breast cancer. So I think we're out a little more heightened awareness, you know, and I think also, you know, we know that women very young can get breast cancer. So I think it, you know, scares that kind of population at that point. So I think it's better screening, um, better community outreach and talking and, you know, just personal experience. When it comes to environmental, yeah, I, I really feel that, you know, obesity is a big culprit of this, you know, um, you know, we have fast food, you know, it's easy processed foods, you know, and I mean, that's a whole different subject to get into. But, you know, I think the overall health of patients, you know, is, is there. So I think there's a lots of environmental factors, you know, and that's, that's where I and Dr. Beck and I are really trying to kind of devour and get into it and trying to, we have a, one of our nurse practitioners looking into like a metabolic syndrome and looking at that, you know, trying to get those things under control. But I think it's a combination of both that's really affecting our younger patients who are diagnosed. I would say uh, I'm open to the possibility that we, we're exposed to more chemicals in our lifetime now. I mean, I, in the upper Midwest with agriculture, the, the 
pesticides and herbicides and trace chemicals uh, that are getting into the water, you know, it prob probably has some factor. And then all of the plastics that we're exposed to may also contribute. The other thing I would say is we are seeing uh, cancers at a younger age throughout. For example, colorectal cancer screening has just moved down five years because we're seeing more. Uh, with breast cancer, I would also be wondering about, you know, we're, we're seeing um, the beginning of menstrual cycles happening younger and younger and is there something that has to do with our lifestyle and or what we eat and or what we're exposed to or is it just part of our evolution as a species that some of these things are happening earlier and may contribute those are just hypotheses so unfortunately we're gonna to have to wrap it up today but we will have you back dr t this has been great, great. Been thank fun. you so yeah. much for uh for being on our team and yeah. then and for being here this evening. Yeah. Well, I appreciate. Thank you guys for having me. You were a great audience. You know, I'm. You know where to find me. Just down the road if you ever need anything. So I, I really appreciate. It. I had a, lots of fun today, and I hope you guys, you know, kind of learned a little bit about breast cancer and got some questions answered. And thanks to all of you yeah. that are watching. If uh, any of you uh, think that this is a program that uh, you know people who would benefit by watching it. Tomorrow it will go um, available on demand on the Above and Beyond Cancer YouTube channel. And it'll also be available to watch on demand at the Mercy One Cancer website. So uh, please uh, share that news. And I hope you'll join us again next week. Thanks, everybody. Thank